Daquan Finn, Baylor quarterback, is in fact, and not a surprise, named the starter. Competition with Sawyer Robertson, the former Mississippi State transfer. Daquan Finn gets the number one, the quarterback one start against Tarleton State, which is one week from Saturday at home against, uh, uh, against Tarleton State for Baylor at McLean Stadium. Now, I've got a couple of nuggets on this, and we can discuss it, but this is not by any means. Most of these decisions we're about to tell you, none of them are like, wow, he got the job, and including Taquan Finn, no matter what Sawyer Robertson tried to do with the competition to make it a tough decision. Yeah, it was um, – I, I think Taquan Finn's been taking – most of the first team reps in fall camp anyway, and more and more and more as each uh, you know, passing day went on uh, to the scrimmage this weekend where I think he took all of the first team snaps uh, from what I've been told. So yeah, this, was, this was, in my mind, inevitable. Uh, and the difference with there being a legit quarterback battle, and this isn't kind of like Gary Bohannon and Blake Shapin. This, to me, is, is a different situation because – Dave Aranda is not in a position where he can just let uh, Daquan Finn work it out. Like if they lose games because of the quarterback position, Sawyer Robertson's going to get a shot because, you know, it's, it's now or never for the Bears. And, you know, if Daquan Finn works out, that's great news. If he does it, then they have Sawyer Robertson and we'll see. Yeah, I mean, you brought in Daquan Finn and invested heavily in him to be the starting quarterback. So any result outside of Daquan Finn being the starting quarterback, I think would have raised some eyebrows and probably been a bit concerning outside of Sawyer Robertson just impressing so much that he's able to blow away Daquan Finn and uh, become the starting quarterback, which if that were the case, I think there would have been signs that he was ready to be your starting quarterback to begin with and wouldn't have been as necessary to go and get a guy of Daquan Finn's caliber uh, because you didn't just go get a quarterback. You got a conference player of the year. So I think the move that was made originally was to end up in this place where he was your starter entering 2024. And so here we are. And uh, that's that. Although I think Sawyer Robertson made it a much longer battle than people anticipated and made it a much tougher battle than maybe even Daquan Finn anticipated. And so Sawyer will undoubtedly play this year because it's been 10 years give or take but about 10 years where Baylor in particular has had to use one more more than one starting quarterback so mm -hmm. if I'm Sawyer Robertson I'm staying ready because odds are I'm going to play and odds are I'm probably going to start at some point if recent history as in the last decade is any indication so he needs to be ready to go um, just like any other backup quarterback around the country but I think he uh, he understands, and Daquan Finn, show us what you got, man, because they spent good money and um, you know made a big decision in making you the guy that they went after, and made you the and making you the guy that they wanted to go invest and 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 bring in here to help save Dave Aranda's job in so many ways. So let's see what he's got because he's definitely uh, electrifying. Some of what I have uh, been able to kind of digest over the the last uh, few hours. Uh, from those who are kind of around the program or who know enough about it that, that they can kind of give me some feedback. One of them, there's no question Daquan Finn. Sawyer Roberts is a really good athlete. But Daquan Finn has the ability to extend plays and make what is just getting out of bounds for a gain of five or seven yards instead of being sacked or losing a yard or two, a chance to take it the distance anytime he starts to run. That also then makes him vulnerable if he's not careful. Pretty big guy, of course, of injuries. Uh, he will actually, unlike most quarterbacks who have tremendous athleticism to run and escape, he will not immediately take off, which you see from some quarterbacks when the first, I guess you could say, option is not open. He will wait a little longer and a little longer, and that's one of the strengths, of course, with him. Now, he doesn't throw the ball like a Tom Brady. He doesn't throw the ball, nobody does, or uh, the perfect throwing motion. He, at times, not even the best what you would think, pure thrower, passer. But he does have the ability to get the ball to where it needs to go uh, and, and has had a pretty good fall camp. Now, one of the other things about him is that uh, you can't teach what he has, the ability to run. Uh, there are certain guys that have it. Uh, RG3 had it. I'm not comparing him to RG3, but certain guys have it. Nobody had it probably better than a Vince Young when he took off from the pocket. There will be some design runs, no doubt about it. And because of that, Paul and Craig, the defense has to be careful to have one more person possibly in the box, which then, if they can, and get something out of it with not just the running game, which is still kind of a question mark, 
but that also means the secondary, that could lead some one-on-one -on -one opportunities for the receiving core, which I'm told their front line's pretty good, but the depth at the wide receiver position is very much a fragile situation. Yeah, I would I would say that uh, past the you know Ashton Hawkins and Hal Presley's of the group, you know there, there's there's not a lot of proven commodities uh, there, and there's a lot of a lot of walk ons. So uh, or guys who used to be walk ons. Baldwin, or Presley, Cameron Hawkins, and prop well Ketron Jackson too, who's yeah. been a little bit in and out. But those are the guys. Yeah. That's the front line of their receiving. But after course. that, you you've got you've got more questions than answers. So. If they can get some guys loose, and look, the most successful Baylor's ever been is when they're running an offense that made you have to, to account for a running quarterback. Uh, Robert Griffin was a running quarterback, obviously. Bryce Petty and Seth Russell both were mm -hmm. pretty good at, at getting first downs. Uh, Nick Florence once had a 77-yard run. Uh, I didn't want to leave him out of this in case he sees it, but I, I don't think he would, he would go bragging about his dual threat ability most of the time. I'll worry about the wide receiver death once I stop worrying about the actual starting wide receivers. Uh, they need to show me something first. Uh, Monterey Baldwin's had flashes. Ashton Hawkins is a guy who you think is going to be pretty good, but, I mean, we still need to see it. And so I, I think, uh, yeah, if it gets to a point where they're worried about the sixth and seventh wide receiver, then um, I guess it will depend on why you're worried about that. Hopefully it's not because of injuries, and hopefully it's just more of a – well, that's, that'd be nice to have a luxury of, of having as deep a wide receiver room as possible. But if the combination of Ashton Hawkins and Monterey Baldwin and Ketron Jackson and Hal Presley and then even sprinkle in a freshman like Jaden Porter, if that can't get the job done, then I don't know what's going wrong with this team, and it's a much bigger issue than just the wide receiver room. Yeah, no, no um, question. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's like down the list of my concerns because other things need to fall in place that are far more important. But, yeah, certainly – I mean, I don't know, man. I think Monterey Ball is a pretty damn good player. He he sh he should be more consistent if you you know really want to raise his uh, his talent levels all the way to ten across the board. I mean, consistency would be one of those things that you you'd bump up if it were like a video game. Beyond that, I don't know. He's pretty good. I mean, Ketron Jackson needs to to show it uh, at this point. Um, but you know, Hal Presley's in that same boat as well. So there's definitely some proving to do, but I think you like Baldwin. I think you like Hawkins. You need the big receivers though, to, to step up and be big receivers for you. And it wouldn't hurt if uh, a Jaden Porter freshman from Lorena uh, made some plays too among uh, Burton. And there's a few others, of course, uh, uh, Bonner that are also a part of this roster. Now, one thing about Sawyer Robertson, uh, one of the things that he does battle he knows this, and it's something that he has to try to work through. He has the, uh, the ability to throw it. He has pretty good athleticism, big, tall kid in the pocket. But one of the things that occurs with him is if he starts to practice off poorly, it's hard for him to dig himself out of that, like to snap out of it. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, you need is consistency at that position. I'm not saying he has bad practice after bad practice. One of the things that is uh, that, that kind of sometimes you want with well, not all you always want is consistency. But if he starts off poorly, it seems like he can't again get out of the rut, and then comes back the next day and might look like an All-American. So those are things that he has to work through, and uh, is something that uh, again, it, when the decision was made, I guarantee you, he probably was calling Coach Spavital among others to try to figure out what else do I need to do. That's the kind of player that he is to make sure and disappointed because of the decision he felt like he could be QB1 heading forward. Now, um, and both players, I'm being told that both players are very much appreciated and respected and loved inside that locker room, which is also uh, very, very important. Now let's get to the offensive line. And then we get to the other quarterback decisions. Uh, yeah, they, the first scrimmage was a nightmare. Right? It, that, no one said that word, but that first scrimmage, I told you what Mason Miller had that look in his eye when he had his, uh, hand, hand, his head in his hands. Uh, it was better in the second scrimmage, but they're going to have to make sure that they set up their offense to, sh to use whatever is the positive among these offensive linemen. And uh, uh, Alvin Ebisoli, is that right, Craig? Ebisoli. Uh, uh, Ebisoli is, is someone that is obviously a very big piece of that offensive line. Barrington, Ebisoli might be someone you can't be careful about making him move around too much because of his size, but they absolutely have to lean on Barrington and, and a few others, which would be nice because the Barringtons last year I thought had just kind of a year. Of course, the offensive line in general was not – very good at all. So there we are with a lot of that. 
as far as the decision with Daquan Finn and Sawyer Robertson for me doing a little bit of due diligence since that, well, even before the decision came down. Cincinnati is going with Brendan Sorsby. He transferred from Indiana. He is now the uh, starting quarterback for Coach Satterfield, Scott Satterfield, and also the Bearcats. This is not a surprise. He came from a Power 4 school. He's a part of a Power 4 school with Cincinnati. He gets the nod. Finished last year with 19 touchdown passes and five picks for the Hoosiers. Yeah, um, clearly he can be efficient. Uh, and uh, Scott Satterfield told us good things about him and that, you know, really the world hasn't seen all the things that he can do based on how they, they struggled in Indiana last year. So uh, we'll see. Um, you know, Cincinnati's got a long way to go. They've got to build um, they got to build that up. But if he can get them, you know, off on the right track, you know, I, I think last year with Emory Jones, they just had a guy that was – uh, super athletic, but man, he's an adventure. And if they can get somebody again, five interceptions, maybe not as much of an adventure. And that's probably what they need right now. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, a situation in Cincinnati right now where I think the good news is that there are no real expectations. I mean, at least from the outside, I don't think Cincinnati is a, a team that gets off mentioned right now uh, because of the transition from Luke Fickle and just the bad year last year opening in the Big 12. So that's cooled them off immensely to the point where, you know, I think people need to be reminded that they're in the league sometimes, honestly. I mean, they just kind of fall through the cracks. Um, and I know part of that's just the regionality as well. And that was one of the concerns if you were a Cincy fan you know, just in general about moving conferences, obviously you took the payday and the, the bigger stage and everything, but I think they're just very much finding their footing. And I think that's the case for all the new schools still. I mean, we'll see with the PAC schools, but I think in terms of, you know, BYU was a struggle last year. Mm -hmm. It stands to be a struggle again this year. Houston, it was a struggle last year. Stands going to be a struggle again this year. Um, and who am I missing there? BYU, uh, Cincinnati and UCF, it was uh, an okay year. You made a bowl game, so that was better than the rest of your brethren, and you expect to be better this year. So they're, they're the one that's on the, the best track. Cincinnati, I don't know where they are in terms of the, the progression to getting where they want to be, uh, but he's a Texas kid, so always uh, like to see Texas guys succeed, and uh, good for him on winning the starting job. I think the, the luxury you have is, yeah, you're just not rolling in with big expectations right now. So you can kind of fly under the radar and, you know, uh, just kind of build things up, and, and hopefully Soresby is the answer to, uh, to some of their questions. But uh, I know this was one of those things that um, we were looking forward to just seeing all these different quarterback battles shake out. So I'm excited to see that some of these are now – uh, being decided and uh, look forward to seeing what Soresby can do for the Bearcats. But uh, there, are, there are not a lot of people that I think are, you know, putting them too much higher than the bottom four in the Big 12, along with, you know, Baylor, uh, BYU, Houston, Arizona State. Maybe those schools are kind of the ones that are going to have to prove people wrong. No, they, they have – there's a clump of six or seven teams that everybody has as the bottom six or seven. This was a great quarterback competition. Preston Stone – We'll start at SMU. Kevin Jennings, who's also a very talented kid from Dallas. He will be QB2 and also get some playing time when they open up their season. Rhett Lashley making that decision. Uh, Stone, by the way, uh, has been named all the various quarterback watch list. A very, very good player. 3,197 yards in his career, 28 touchdowns. And he uh, led them, of course, uh, to a hell of a year back in 2023. But it was Jennings who played in the bowl game and was very productive for the Mustangs and Lashley. Yeah, not a surprise to me, Craig. I don't think this was ever – I mean, I'm yeah. sure Jennings made a competition, but with Preston Stone coming back, I didn't ever think that he was not going to be the starting quarterback. Uh, so, yeah, kudos to Jennings for, you know, making it more of a competition maybe than – uh, I expected at least can't speak for everybody else, obviously, but I mean, Preston Stone's a pretty good quarterback. So him coming back by default, I just imagined he was always going to be the guy. And so he is. And, and yeah, that's what I expected all along. Uh, so, you know, good to see it made official and he'll have the honor of, you know, being the guy that leads them into the ACC. Uh, so long as he can stay healthy enough for the you know first yep. couple of weeks. But uh, again, as I said yesterday, I don't know how much interest there is nationally in SMU or even regionally for that matter. Uh, but I, I am looking forward to just seeing, you know, that early game against Florida State and kind of seeing how this breath of fresh air that is this new conference uh, and being on a stage they feel like they deserve to be on after all these years. Uh, I, I wonder, you know, what that's – or I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what that looks like. And if they're wildly successful early on, then – that could that could mean a little something um, and, and would be kind of interesting. But uh, if not, you know, uh, 
I'm sure people will just go back to not really caring that much. It's a good problem to have when you have Jennings as your backup, who, who got a lot of snaps and a, a bunch because of Stone injured at the end of the year, but also uh, not a, always available uh, during the spring. Uh, by the way, Eric said something about Monterey Baldwin as a playmaker. His last two years have been close to identical. 36 catches, 623 yards, four touchdowns. The year before, 33 catches, 565 yards, four touchdowns. He is a playmaker. There were times they just couldn't get the ball to him. He's not real thick, big. He's, got, he's an inside receiver, and he has to try to also get himself free and open. So with, uh, with what they have with Hawkins coming in, uh, that might be something a secondary has to worry about both of them if they ever line up at the same time. Uh, Malik Murphy transferred from UT because of their quarterback room being so good and so thick and so deep. Well, he's now the starter at Duke. Not a surprise here either. He will open up against Elon and they open up the game, uh, uh, excuse me, open up the season. Um, he started two games last year for Texas against BYU and Kansas State, but he now has been named the starter. We'll have Stephen Weissman, who covers a lot of the ACC in that North Carolina area. He'll join us today in the 4 o'clock hour. All right, one more. Lincoln Riley is named Miller Moss. As the starting quarterback, not a surprise. There's other schools, but these are some of the ones highlighted. He's the one that had the huge bowl game, six touchdowns, nearly 400 yards passing uh, in that win for USC in the bowl game. Uh, he's now the starter. And, man, you just think about all the quarterbacks who have been in and out of that system, uh, from Malachi Nelson to Jackson Dart to everybody else. Lincoln Riley has his guy. And his starting quarterbacks have been what? Caleb Williams, Baker Mayfield, Jalen Hurts, Kyler Murray, and I'm missing one in there somewhere. Spencer Rattler. Spencer Rattler. He has had some, some absolute studs at the quarterback position. Miller Moss is the starting quarterback going into the year for USC. You know, Spencer Rattler was really the only – well, I mean, Spencer Rattler was very highly touted uh, coming in, as you knew, and, and Craig can speak to this a lot more. But Miller Moss is the first one that uh, doesn't come in – as close to a surefire thing as anybody else that he's had in his career. You know, and look, Miller Moss is clearly talented. He had that great bowl game, and there's there's all this. But there are far more questions about Miller Moss than any other quarterback that Lincoln Riley has ever coached, I think. Uh, he was a four-star, nearly top 100 guy. So, I mean, he wasn't a five-star, top 10 guy, I guess is what you're getting at there yeah. as far as super elite guy. But he's still pretty elite, and uh, I don't think anybody playing – quarterback for Lincoln Riley is, is not going to be but yeah I mean not as heralded as the most heralded guys but still pretty heralded and uh yeah he had a fantastic bowl game to end the year and really uh, made a name for himself and made a lot of noise and uh I you know sent him off into the into the postseason on a, on a high note as far as his potential goes so uh yeah I'm excited to see more of him because uh, he put on a hell of a show and then with Malik Murphy uh, I thought you know the log jam at texas was eventually going to have to give way and didn't see where he had a had an opening uh really outside of just injury so we got to see a little bit of him and uh, i'm i'm excited to see what he can do at duke uh with that opportunity and and being the man there um in, in uh, at duke is going to be i think uh very interesting so yeah uh, I'm, i like both of these or i expected both of these moves and uh, it's good to see them made official and i'm excited to watch both these guys when i mentioned the names of kyler murray jalen hurts caleb williams uh, uh, Spencer Rattler, Baker Mayfield, some of them, but all of them could get out of the, out of trouble. All of them had the ability to be mobile. Obviously, Kyler Murray, Hurts, and Caleb Williams could absolutely fly and run. Mayfield's very mobile. That's why he's still playing in the NFL uh, and because he, he was very good about kind of giving getting that extra second or two or take it off to pick up a first down. Uh, and Rattler could do that, too, before he transferred and, and at South Carolina at times. So he's doing pretty well in the preseason. Seems yeah. like he's had a, a pretty good start to his career. At least I know it's preseason, but he, he's made some plays already it, there. He, he might be someone, and this, this happens rarely, but is more suited to be an NFL quarterback than he is to be a college quarterback, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, probably like that, it, it can Lots happen. of guys are yeah. one or the other, yeah. 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 Like, it, it just – it's it just suits him maybe better. Yep. So person personality wise, I'm looking forward to see what Malik Murphy could do. I thought he handled everything incredibly well uh, when he was at Texas and when he had to play when when Ewers went down. Colorado had a special teams coach that just all of a sudden was gone. Uh, I saw with Brian Howell who writes and covers Colorado. Trevor Riley 
was the guy who was overseeing their special teams, no longer with the program. Uh, and there was been no comment whether he resigned or was let go. But remember, we mentioned George Hilo last week was picked up by Deion Sanders. That is the position he will take as far as the staff number uh, to replace Trevor Riley, White, Riley, who is no longer at Colorado. Oklahoma State. How about this? A QR code on their helmet. So a normal human being that's watching the game on television at the stadium anywhere else can get on the QR code and give them or donate to that specific player's NIL fund. I mean, good for the players. Uh, Jack and I talked about this earlier. This kind of makes me die inside a little. I mean, just it's, I mean, fine. If you want to do this, if you want to give your money to the players, I think they, they earn it, they deserve it. I'm not going to, you know, if you, if you guys want to put a QR code on all three of us and send us money, I guess I wouldn't, I yeah. guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I'll tape it on my forehead but, now. Um, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's a bit much, I guess. I don't tip cashiers. I'm not going to tip the players. Yeah, I just would like to be able to watch a game without being asked to give money to somebody mm. at a university. Yeah. Uh, you can't even watch the game now without, in so many roundabout ways, being asked to, to donate while you watch the game, mind you. I think it's a cool idea technology-wise. I'll point out what a lot of other people have pointed out. This is the same Mike Gundy that just days ago was talking about how Absolutely. no more money talk and yep. the season started and yet here we are less than a week later and you know basically Oklahoma State's promoting the fact or being promoted to you know have these QR codes to pay players so it's just you know kind of funny that he's the other day was shutting down all that talk and now here they are um, getting a little bit of spotlight for just that they're not the first to put I mean D Dion in Colorado were doing the QR code thing on jerseys uh, I think Oregon's done it I know UCF's done it I mm -hmm. think so uh, the QR codes on uniforms are not entirely brand new, but it's a cool idea. It's cool technology. And if you're somebody that, you know, is watching Ollie Gordon run and you decide to put your phone up to the screen and send him a thousand bucks or something, then more power to you. I can guarantee you I will never make one of these donations, you know, during the QR code. But I know that there's probably a lot of people that will. So, you know, good on Oklahoma State for being forward thinking and, uh, again, I just marvel at the technology we've got now. If you were to tell people about all the things about college football going on, some of them would probably, like, you know, grasp their uh, or clutch their pearls or, you know, just wonder what the hell is going on in, in today's age. But, you know, it's one thing to talk about an expanded playoff or conference moves. It's another thing to try to explain to people from the past about QR codes on helmets and sending donations, you know, through your phone. And, like, it's just wild. Like, that, that part of it to me is just so interesting. But... Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea for trying to get more money donated, although you're definitely wanting to focus on the season at this point. I didn't send this to you, Jack, but Amanda Kristovich of Front Office Sports said, if you're an agent, quit calling us and asking for more money, but it's it's time to focus on football. She was taking off with the Gundy, what, what you said, mentioned. Yeah. yeah, But if you're a fan, feel free to scan the NIL QR code and uh, on the backs of our helmets and contribute to... Uh, giving the program and players so, money. Basically, Mike Gundy says, quit asking me, ask them. Yeah. 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 Or don't ask me, just go do it. Yeah. Um, is basically I, I, probably what he's hoping for, at least. But, yeah, that's that's cool technology. And I, I will say, though, again, I, I I wonder where they're going to take it next, not Oklahoma State, but just in general. Of like, now you're just watching the game, and it's basically saying, pay me. You know what I mean? Like, everything, everything's about paying the players now. Everything so for so long was about not paying them or at least not acknowledging paying them, and now – everything even the uniforms the patches the qr codes it's, it's about paying players as well so it's definitely a different world all right also let's get to one of the bigger stories too we had a lot of quarterback uh, information but courtney morgan who was at washington with kaylin DeBoer, now at alabama he was being courted by i believe it was usc was one of the schools talking to him he got a new contract i saw where mike rodak was uh, writing about this yesterday $825,000 a year as the general manager of Alabama. He's a star in the personnel business, uh, a leading figure when it comes to front office space and what people are doing these days. And so now when you get all that extra money, of course, some of it, a lot of it, a big chunk of it will go to the players with revenue sharing. You also need even more because if you have Courtney Morgan making 825000 and by the way, Courtney, damn, good for you, man. Congratulations and yes. anyone else. But doesn't he have a staff underneath him? Mm -hmm. And that's now another department with new salaries that probably could end up 
I don't know, with a million or two or three dollars added to the budget. Yeah, good, good for them. You know, and Alabama good. won't blink. Yeah, and this is where when I, I, you know, if you're if you're a P, uh, like if you're a P four school, and I know this is not a blanket statement because some do, but if you're telling me that you don't have enough money to do things, then I don't. I'm not going to be likely to believe you uh, because the part of their defense all this time is there's no money out there. There's no money out there. Where's this money going to come from? And then you're like, well, I mean, you pay these people a lot of money. You know, that he that's like four four college professors that have been there for 30 years at Alabama right there, maybe five um, people who have been working very long time doing research. That's what that salary is right there. So let's not pretend like you don't have money. Um, now, if you're somebody else, then yeah, I get that. But yeah, nobody in the SEC, Big Ten, or or most anywhere else should ever be like, what are we going to do? We don't I don't have think money. they've ever done that, though, Paul. <laughs> I don't know. Well, that Greg it, Sankey's out there saying, I don't know, kids want to pay taxes. Like, they do. Yeah, I mean, I that's mean, the old head. Yeah. Like, that's the that's the argument when you know that they're just not being all that honest about it. But I don't think anybody in the SEC's cried poverty yeah. uh, lately. I, I feel like that complaint has come from smaller schools. Um, and I don't know. All it takes is a half a second and uh, a connection to the Internet to – see what the sec is making as far as per team goes even the teams that don't really provide that much value mm -hmm. uh, are making more than teams that provide much greater value in different leagues so yeah the the crying poverty thing i don't think many do that um but that is interesting if that's something that that sankey's trying to to portray um so take that how you will but yeah i mean this guy's a, a star in that part of the industry and the industry continues to expand including to you know all of these various off the field roles and i could tell by the reaction that this was a big get for alabama because uh he was being looked at by i, I forget the school did you mention that usc, uh, USC I yeah believe it was usc yeah. so usc was right on that cage a little bit and uh you know alabama fans seemed thrilled by the report that they were hanging on to him because of the role that he plays. So uh, obviously a, a big, uh, I guess, a big signing or I guess a, a you know big deal to have him stay on board, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's a trend. It, yeah. it's, a, it's a new trend. And, and you see personnel people and the GMs being named. And how that all works and how the coach and who gets to – who's going to make the decision? I would think that if Oklahoma State – and they, I, they have somebody, but – the head coach in football is still going to be the decision maker. In the NFL, it's the general manager along with the head coach who it depends on how much clout he has, like Sean Payton or someone like that. How much will the general manager have when it comes to recruiting as far as making decisions on the players they actually take, or is it just a suggestion? Um, I think it's going to vary coach to coach, program to program. The coach is going to be – I mean, the way I see this is that – uh, most athletic departments and the way it'll run is that the um, the athletic director is like the the board of directors. I mean, like not, but like he's the he's yeah. over here. Well, how's the, the general coach, manager going to work? The coach is the G is essentially the GM when it comes to who he wants and all that. And the GM is maybe this is more like a Will McClay situation where you know he goes in and tells the coach these are the guys that you want to look at but ultimately the coach is going to decide well uh, again he's making 825 which is fantastic Kalen DeBoer's making probably double digit millions so that that also has a lot to do with who has the clout to make the decisions but he relies on this young man to help him and and, and I, I think it's yeah. great that this is a new part uh, of I, I I know that this another level of it but Hey, these uh, guys have been helping with decisions for a long time. I'll call it a, like a Belichick Parcells model where okay. they're really making the decisions, but they've got a general manager who aids them in that. Craig, if you'll remember, Bill Parcells said, if you want me to cook the meal, I want to buy the groceries. Yeah, that was his take on it. Yep. Um, Kalen DeBoer is his own man, so I don't know how – you know, that all is divvied up in the Alabama offices, and I don't imagine that it's the same there as it is everywhere else, but uh, pretty soon everybody who can is going to have a GM of some sort, and the bigger schools will have more of the, the high-profile guys whose names, I guess, we get to learn now, and um, certainly we'll learn of some rising stars, and 
I think that'll be a nice landing pad for, you know, former head coaches or just, you know, guys from other parts of the game that, you know, find their footing in, in that area of things now. So, yeah, that's that's something that's now a part of the fabric and will be even more so uh, moving forward with this being the player era. Uh, so, yeah, it's good to have a guy to, to help wrangle some of those responsibilities that have grown wildly over the last couple of years. I think that's the biggest thing is you can't be Kalen DeBoer and do everything the way that you could do it a few years ago. You have to have other people helping you out. So um, he's clearly one of the, the stars uh, in that role in college football right now. Good for Bama to defend off the Trojans. And I think, yeah, each unique uh, partnership will be unique and be different than, you know, what somebody else at some other school is doing. So hard to say what his role is versus what Kalen DeBoer, you know, says is the last word. He was with DeBoer at Fresno State when DeBoer got his first FBS job. He was on the plane when DeBoer landed in Tuscaloosa to, uh, Tuscaloosa to take the job to replace Nick Saban. So there we are. Now, I remember James Blanchard, who's now at Tech, who was at Baylor for a while, uh, in the NFL with Ruwitz Shaw, uh, with the uh, Carolina Panthers. His deal, I, I believe was reported at two years, 800000 And here's Morgan getting 825. So you're going to start to see those salaries jump. But obviously, it depends on the money that is also available. UTSA, here is the new look for them. Not every week, but this is part of a new look for them. Black and white. But I like the back of their helmet. It has San Antonio on it. There's the Roadrunner, UTSA in the front. But there's the new look. I saw a, a, a note from somebody on these uniforms. If your school colors do not include what is on your uniform, then should it count? And and that that's a that's uh, this not, is different. Like it's a, different. It's not look. You're not going to see Alabama and Texas do this. No. But UTSA with the black and white look. But remember, if you're mad about this, they're not doing it for you at all. That's exactly They're right. They're not doing it yeah. for you at all. They're doing it because it's going to help them recruit. It's going to help their apparel partner make more money. Uh, you ever watch the NFL when they do the color rush? They're not doing it for you. They're doing it because some idiot's going to go, ooh, I want that. Yeah. Here's my $212. Boom. Yep. Uh, remember those Steelers jerseys that were just so awful? The like prison the throwbacks ones? that yeah. looked like Bumblebee. Like, yeah, Bumblebee. You know, I was a, a, a Bumblebee in jail. That They didn't do that because they thought it was cool. They thought, like, well, there's some idiots in Pittsburgh that are going to give us $200. Well, if, if it does sell and it's more money, more revenue, and then uh, that's exactly what they're going to do. Yeah, it's a nod to the Spurs, uh, clearly, with the color scheme there. And uh, also cool to see the San Antonio skyline on the back of the helmet. Uh, that's a, a ni nice look. I saw a couple people that weren't the biggest fans of these, but I like them. I think they look sharp. It's hard to go wrong with black and white, black, silver, and white. So uh, I like the incorporating the the pro franchise in town and just doing something a little bit different. I'm sure they'll likely wear these at a night game, a uh, blackout game mm -hmm. would make a lot of sense. Don't know um, off the top of my head what the schedule looks like, but I could definitely see that being incorporated for, you know, one of their bigger conference matchups. So, yeah, I like them. I, I think that they're sharp and a nice alternate to the, you know, typical orange and blue, especially given that there's a reason – why the colors make sense in San Antonio. Well, with the Spurs connection, you're right. I'm glad you brought that up. That absolutely makes sense.